Hello everyone, and welcome to this BioViz track presentation. My name is Patrick Martin, and I'm a postdoctoral researcher at the Biotech Research and Innovation Center in Copenhagen. I work under the supervision of Professor Wong. Today I will be presenting Vesalius, image-free extraction and analysis of tissue anatomy by using image processing applied to sequencing-based spatial transcriptomics. To start this presentation, I would like to take all of you on a journey. A journey back in time. You see, the ancient Egyptians provide us with some of the earliest descriptions of the human body and human anatomy. The Edwin Smith Papyrus, for example, is a military treatise that describes wounds and injuries and how to treat them. It was a field guide for military surgeons. We cannot talk about human anatomy without at least mentioning Andreas Vesalius. Andreas Vesalius, the 16th century academic, provided us with some of the most exquisite hand-drawn depictions of the human body. Today, the study of anatomy takes a very different form. In the last few years, we have seen the rise of spatial transcriptomics. Simply put, spatial transcriptomics is a method that enables us to recover the transcriptome of a cell or a section of tissue while maintaining the position of said cell or tissue. It comes in two main flavors, either image-based, such as Murfish, or sequencing-based, such as Tenex Visium or SlideSeq version 2. Today I will be focusing on SlideSeq version 2, a sequencing-based spatial transcriptomic method. Simply put, SlideSeq version 2 makes use of barcoded beads. Each bead has a unique barcode that is associated to it. After depositing these beads on a glass slide and a preliminary round of sequencing, you now know where each of these beads are to be found on the glass slide. You can take your tissue section of interest, deposit it on this glass slide containing these beads, and after hybridization between these bead barcodes, unique molecular identifiers, and the mRNA counts, present in your tissue, you now have access to the transcriptome of this tissue in a spatially resolved manner. Now, SlideSeq version 2 has some benefits and advantages. For one, it is high coverage. You can really take a very large tissue section and run spatial transcriptomic essays upon it. The other aspect is being a sequencing-based method, it is high throughput. Some of the slides provided by the Slidesig version 2 team recover up to 20,000 genes in the mouse genome. And finally, it is high resolution. The spacing between each bead is estimated to be around 10 micrometers, which is roughly equivalent to the size of a single cell. Now, it should be noted that there is no guarantee that a barcode will recover transcripts from one cell only it is possible that it will recover transcripts from multiple cells. We wondered if we could recover anatomical territories using spatial transcriptomic data such as SlideSeq. But more specifically, could we use image processing to study spatial transcriptomics? In the case of 10x Visium, there are reference images that are provided with the spatial transcriptomic essay. You can easily relate the expression of certain genes and the territories from whence they came. There is, however, a catch. In a case of high-resolution techniques such as SlideSeq, there are no reference images provided. So would it be possible to extract anatomical territories without using reference images? Undeterred by these challenges, we developed the Vesalius algorithm. Vesalius is available as an R package. First, it requires sequencing-based spatial transcriptomic data. Once the count matrices have been normalized, scaled, and variable features have been extracted, we can reduce the dimensionality of the data using principal component analysis. In this context, principal component analysis provides us with loading values essentially the variance associated to each gene within each principal component. 
we can use these loading values to embed them into the RGB color space. To do so, we take the loading values associated to each gene, take their absolute value, sum them up, and then normalize them to ensure that these values are between 0 and 1. When we do this for the first principal component, we now have a value that is bound between 0 and 1 for every single bead. This becomes the value we assign to the red channel. We do the same thing for the principal component 2 and for principal component 3, being the green channel and the blue channel, respectively. Now that we have colors, but also coordinates, we can rebuild images. And now that we have these images, we can start applying image processing techniques, such as histogram equalization or smoothing, and finally segmentation. Once we have these color segments, we can go a step further and dissect these segments into separated territories in 2D space. If we were to take the SlideSeq data as described previously and pass it through this pipeline, we would obtain something like this. The image on the left is a representation of transcriptomic profiles of each bead embedded into the RGB color space. What we see is that this representation recovers many anatomical structures as seen in the mouse hippocampus. We are able to recover the dentate gyrus, for example, the corpus callosum, and even the third ventricle and the medial habenula. But something that comes to mind is that these images are highly grainy. They seem to be very noisy. And this is where image processing comes into play. This image here is the resulting image after passing through image processing techniques. We used histogram equalization to increase the contrast between colors. We used variance regularization to denoise the image slightly. We went a step further and smoothed the image using Gaussian blurs and median blurs. And finally, we used a k-mean segmentation approach to extract these territories. The interesting thing is that a territory now becomes a combination of all the beads present within that territory. It becomes a lot less noisy. And once we have these segmented images, we can further subdivide these color segments into spatially distinct territories. This is achieved by pooling beads that are close together in 2D space or separating beads that are far away from each other in 2D space. The resulting territories are the ones you see here. There are 58 territories that we found based on the parameters that we had selected. These territories here are represented in false color. But now that we have these territories, what exactly can we do with them? One thing we can do is apply conventional clustering methods on isolated territories. For example, here we have the clustering analysis of the isolated CA field. And we can see that we recover all three pyramidal layers, CA1, CA2 and CA3. If we had used standard clustering approaches on the entire slide, we would not have been able to recover these subtle differences. And these subtle differences are even more visible if we look at the third ventricle and the medial habenula. The medial habenula seems to be characterized by two distinct clusters in the UMAP projections, and both of these clusters are spatially distinct as well. This suggests that despite the fact that both of these clusters are enriched with markers associated to this tissue, there is a spatially driven expression difference between them. This effect is also visible when we look at the third ventricle. There is a clear distinction between the lower third ventricle and the third ventricle itself. It goes even as far as describing a third ventricle border layer between the third ventricle and the oligodendrocyte neighbors. We can also use this territory-based approach to try and find novel markers. In this instance, 
we dissected out the dentate gyrus. We tried to find any gene that was specifically enriched within the dendate gyrus. One gene that came out was the C1QL2 gene. When we looked at the Allen Brain Atlas in situ hybridization images, it confirmed that this gene was highly expressed within the dendate gyrus. What is interesting is that the C1QL2 gene is not considered a canonical dendate gyrus marker according to the Allen Brain Atlas. We hope that this territory-based method can enable us to discover more territory-based markers. But we can go a step further. As these territories are represented as images, we can start to apply morphological operators to them. Here, we have the dissected dentate gyrus on which we applied a very slight dilation. And after passing it through conventional clustering methods, we realize that we recognize the granule cell layer, the molecular layer, and the polymorph layer. This led us to wonder, could we find border-specific gene expression? And when we compared the dentate gyrus polymorph layer to the dentate gyrus granule cell layer, we found certain genes that were differentially expressed. So we were interested in discovering if there was a layering effect of these territories. So, using this approach, we layered our dilated territory into various layers and tried to find genes that were differentially expressed between each layers. And what we found was that the CST3 gene was highly expressed in the outer layer and more specifically at the border between the dentate gyrus granule cell layer and the dentate gyrus polymorph layer. These findings were confirmed when looking at the in situ hybridization images provided by the Allen Brain Atlas. To conclude, I hope I have convinced you that image processing applied to spatial transcriptomic data is not only possible, but provides deeper insights into this type of data. By dissecting and isolating territories prior to cell clustering, we were really able to gain an in-depth understanding of the subtle gene expression patterns that occur there. For example, when we looked at the third ventricle in the medial habenula, we realized that there were two compartments, despite the fact that both of these compartments seem to be distinct clusters and both highly expressed markers associated with their respective tissue types. We can also use this territory-based approach to find novel markers associated to anatomical structures. And as these territories are represented as images, we can provide a way to layer these territories and gain insights into expression patterns that occur at the border of territories. This whole project brought up some challenges, most notably cell type annotations. In many cases, these subtle gene expression patterns are not necessarily accounted for in customary cell type annotations. It could be that these are subcell types that are not accounted for or even that there is something more subtle going on, potentially some gene expression gradients. To conclude, the Vesalius package is available on GitHub for any person who would be interested in playing around with this package. And we have a bioarchive paper that will be released very soon. Finally, I would like to thank the OneLab for their constant support and feedback throughout the development of this project. I would like to give a special thanks to Professor Wan for his guidance in creating this algorithm and developing this package, as well as Cecilia, who provided some insights and some feedback during our many conversations about the development of this code. Finally, I would like to thank all of you for your patience in listening to this presentation, and I would gladly take any questions.